And we, as I said, we do these courses uh, regularly. We have opens, uh, opens, uh, sorry, summer school. Uh, then we also do, uh, we do also a uh, lot of uh, workshops and, and you can follow some of these courses. You can, you can follow this uh, website I send you. Um, so there are these uh, uh, series uh, we publish on this uh, German, uh, uh, German website. Uh, which is uh, under the uh, German Institute of uh, Information Technology, uh, German Library of Information Technology. Uh, you can follow them. Uh, so uh, you can follow just the talks and uh, every, every talk you pick up, it is really like a YouTube. There's no difference. Uh, you can just play and uh, you will see it's, uh, uh, it works fine. So uh, now I think this is uh, muted, but uh, it uh, works, uh, works no problem. Um, everybody still follows me, Leandro? Everything is okay? Yep. Okay. So, uh, so this is the, uh, the, uh, the, the things that said you can already find. And so now the plan for today, uh, the first uh, hour, uh, I will talk a bit about uh, um, the predictive soil mapping, uh, predictive soil mapping in R. And uh, I will explain you a bit uh, the background and um, you know, that's the state of the art and how the things went from uh, using some geostatistics to doing machine learning. So, and then I will show you how to use a land map package. Uh, and I, will, I have a tutorial worked out and I even make this uh, um, data set so I can demonstrate different uh, mapping techniques. And, uh, and there is also a paper, I don't know if you know, there's a, a PJ paper uh, where which explains you know how you use a, a random forest for uh, um, basically predictive mapping as a general framework and, and this paper looks like it's going quite well it has almost uh, 200 citations in two years so almost 100 citations a year uh, so please also take a look at that um, and so that's the plan for the first one hour uh, that I go in and just show you that uh, in our studio how that works. And I will do some demonstrations. We will open the maps. Uh, you can ask some questions. Uh, but the, the idea is that, uh, yeah, we just go uh, like uh, a bit like a fast run through predictive soil mappings. And, and then I do the demo. And then I will introduce you to some uh, special temporal data sets. Uh, and and then, then I will switch to this one, which is way more complex. Uh, which is the space-time modeling. Uh, and here, they're very nice case studies. And uh, one case study is a, a mapping of daily temperatures. Uh, so that's a case study where you can uh, uh, see how you do a space-time overlay, even how you run it in parallel, how you fit a model, how you make a prediction, and then how you visualize on the end, you visualize uh, something like this. So you can see the uh, changes of... Uh, of temperature to time. So it's a space time interpolation basically. Um, and then also there's a data set on the soil moisture. So that's the thing I'm going to do tomorrow. So, uh, so I will explain how you do ensemble machine learning, how you do this blocking. And on the end, again, you get these predictions and you can also predict through depth and time. And so it's a quite, uh, a quite advanced, uh, quite advanced to do space time machine learning. But, uh, but that's the idea, that's more or less the idea. So today, uh, more introduction, uh, and then uh, how to use a landmark package, how do you run ensemble machine learning? And then a bit about special temporal data. And then I will switch to uh, Leandro. Leandro will do also about one hour and he will talk about uh, computing, using large data sets, using geotiffs. Uh, how do you access files? How do you space time overlay? and how do you use these things and so so that's more or less idea and i don't know if you if you have a question you know at any time you can uh you can interrupt you can pose a question uh you can also uh if you're already using i mean so now my first question to you will be for example how much do you use uh, r or are you familiar with it and i don't know uh valdir if you could do that uh is a, a little poll or something in zoom uh, that would be very useful for us to do some poll and to just to find out uh, quickly, like what is your level of R and so that we don't go too fast uh, or too slow. Valdir, I don't know if that's an option that you 
or, or you know already about your students? I mean, do you guys do something more basic, advanced? Is it some of you, is it the first time you use R? So there's something I really have to know because there's no point that they go very fast. If you, if you know, if you are not, uh, you know, not up to date. And also there's no point that they go very slow if you really actually are experienced and advanced. So, uh, so I will start with the uh, install packages, uh, land map, right? So I will start uh, uh, with that and then, um, now it's restarting. And uh, so, uh, so that's something you can do you can do while I'm talking, you know, you just install the land map. There is also a package called plotkml, but maybe we can, uh, we can do it tomorrow. Um, I see some intermediate, some experience or so mixture. Uh, and also, I don't know, uh, Valdir, I don't know if most of people are like familiar with soil data. Uh, so I don't know, like, are you all guys doing soil science or is it environmental science? What is your kind of uh, background? I think that they are familiar with it, I think. Okay. Uh, I have a book also. Uh, so I have a book uh, which is under the soilmapper.org. Uh, so there's a book and uh, this book is, I mean, it's making R markdown. So for those of you that know uh, R, that you know what it is, but uh, basically I made it in R studio. And, uh, and so there's this book and uh, this book is, uh, it needs to be uh, updated. I didn't touch it from 2019, so I need to update it. But it, it has, uh, I think, many, many things that you need, maybe for later, you know, like the, uh, if I go to statistical uh, th uh, theory for predictive soil mapping, there's the aspects of spatial variability, you know, uh, then you can do uh, different methods to do uh, from geostatistics, universal Krieging, Right, then you can do simulations, uh, block uh, block predictions, point predictions, uh, and then one of the, one of the nice things, you know, when you look at R, uh, some people that made uh, you know that made packages like the uh, Max Kuhn that made this carrot package. Uh, so this is really state of the art, and I can also just copy that uh, and put it uh, here in the R Studio. Um, so that's kind of the state of the art. And, and so uh, what, what you see here is, for example, the, the basic principles of predictive soil mapping is that you, uh, you basically you have, you have a point data set. So the point data set, is, which is called Muse, and there's the, this uh, Muse grid. And then you have the, you have the uh, different algorithms. Uh, let's say we call them learners, or you call them uh, statistical models. Uh, so the different things, and uh, and then you can you can run this uh, comparison. Uh, so I put it as a comparison here, and uh, and once I finish the comparison, I can then see uh, I can visualize the results, and I can see you know what's the difference between different methods. So uh, I don't know if this code now if I I haven't touched it from two thousand nineteen. If if I'm if I did a do good coding, it should work. So let's try the carrot and GDAL. Uh, so there are two packages here and I can load this data set. And as you said, the data set, it's a, uh, you know, it's just like I can plot it maybe, let me see, um, plot. So it, it looks like it's some point data set and I could also plot it in, a, let me plot it in Google Earth. Um, So let's do it like this and I'll put a working directory, something to the temp or something. Oh, by the way, I, I, uh, I don't really use Windows. Uh, I, I program mainly in uh, uh, Ubuntu, but I knew also most of you probably use Windows. So we decided to switch uh, to, switch to uh, uh, Windows. So I have this machine with us, but I will show you, we can also do so then I do plot KML news. Let's see this. So we get this stuff. So now we we see this data here actually, and, and I I took the first variable uh, to plot on the list. I, I'm not sure which variable uh, popped up, but I I assume it's uh, 
let me see what's the first variable on the list. Um, so the first one is cadmium. And let's say if I want to plot, uh, I want to plot uh, zinc. So then I get zinc. Now I have to turn off this one. So here's the zinc concentration. Uh, and we see there's some hot spots here. Uh, and we see that uh, in general, it looks like the, the main uh, reason for the higher values is as you get closer to the river. You get closer to the river, then you see higher values. Um, so that's, uh, that's something interesting. And, and so, uh, and this is like a soil variable. This is now just the top soil, but it's a soil variable. So we could do, we could now map that and we could uh, use, uh, for example, distance to the river to map that. And, um, and then we could do comparison. And, and so here in the current package, uh, so I load this data, I have to overlay points and this is the overlay points and uh, grids. And then I create what is called a regression matrix, this one here. So let's open this one. So here we get the regression matrix. And so what we see here uh, that we got this uh, uh, in the last uh, two lines, Sorry, in the last line, we got the distance uh, to the, uh, no, uh, sorry, did it, did it put it the last line or the first line? Uh, yo, the first, so the first, so the first, uh, uh, first few lines up till here, so the first five columns, they are values of the grids, because as you see, there's also these uh, uh, grids, and I can also plot them like this. Let's plot the first one. So this is just a, a split A and B. Uh, this one is a yeah, split uh, indicators. This is the distance to the river. And this one is a soil, I think a soil map or a flooding map. And this one, uh, it's the flooding map. So, so we have these uh, maps uh, here. As you see, I can visualize them. Um, of course, it's much uh, nicer to put, for example, this thing, let's say the, the, the number four, I can put it into Google Earth also. Uh, so let's do that. And so we can see that uh, uh, this is the soil map in the in the background. Um, and uh, and then I can uh, I can play a bit with this uh, grid, and I can uh, uh, set transparency. So so we see like how much that soil map matches uh, landscape. Difficult to see. This is Netherlands is so flat, right? So there's not much to see. Although. Here it looks like it's, this is a bit higher here. It looks like it's a bit higher terrain. Do you see this? So the, the, even in Netherlands, there's some landscape. Uh, and so what's also very interesting, then you look at this data set, it looks this point is falling in the, in the water. So, so you will say, oh, they messed up. They did something wrong. Uh, so, but we can check that. We can turn on this thing here, which is the history. And thanks to Google guys, and well, thanks to people that created Google, Google Earth and uh, the technology. So we can scroll back in the time and we can see this really the dynamic landscape, right? This was all water at one stage in uh, March, 2007, it was all water. And we can go even further back. And then you can see there was some times when it was uh, not water. And so most likely if I will go way back uh, to the year that it was collected, I'm not sure when it was collected, I think 19, 1990 something, uh, probably in that year, this was not flooded. So it was actually, it was actually land. And that's why you have this point uh, falling here in the water, but uh, actually most likely it was, it was land. And so, uh, so we have this data set. And so what we can do now we can do some benchmarking. So I have to add this indicator variable. Uh, and so what do I do here? So I look at the, you can see my, my uh, screen, right? You can see the text, you can read it. Yes, it's fine. Yes. yes. So what do I do here? Uh, I use the current package. It's really nice for the comparison of models. It's for predictive modeling. Uh, and I say like this, I want to do a repeated cross validation. I want to split uh, predictions and validation into uh, two classes. So 
So one, so 50% I use uh, for uh, training and 50% for validation. I could also put a number, let's say three. Uh, then it will do uh, three times. And then just to be sure, I want to repeat uh, two times. In this case, I can say I repeat once. So I define how I want to do bench, uh, benchmarking. So then the next thing, I specify uh, the, the learners. Uh, and I start with the most simple learner. It, it says that the organic, and I'm focused on organic matter here, by the way. And so organic matter is function of uh, of nothing basically of of an indicator which is a one, so it means that it's a it's a kind of a, a flat model, so it's a you you avoid any complexity of that model. So the model is purely uh, basically interested in values uh, that you sample, and and so what you do with this current train actually you it will just estimate the mean value. So it's like a sampling, like a stratified sampling. That's what it does. So it will only estimate the mean value. And because this variable, if I look at the, the, the uh, uh, histogram of the organic matter, I can see that it's uh, actually really skewed. Uh, so this thing, so I can see it's a bit skewed. So it's a much better to do a log, uh, log one P. Uh, and that way the variable becomes like close to normal. So it's a much more normal when I do a log. So that's why I said uh, there's a Gaussian link uh, log link function because I want the log normal model. And, and as you say, once I define this uh, training, um, I can uh, uh, then run this training and I can do a benchmarking. And the second model is that the organic matter. So first model is organic matter is function of nothing. So I can only sample it and get like a, a mean estimate. The second model is that the organic matter is function of the soil map. So these are the soil classes and soil classes will be treated as indicators. So every, so if you look at this map, uh, every soil type will be treated as an indicator. So if it's a red, uh, yellow or gray, I don't know, now there's some Dutch uh, soil classification system, it will be treated as an indicator. So that's the second model. It's that the organic matter is a function of a soil map. Then the third model is that I add uh, to the soil map. I also add distance to the water and flooding frequency, okay? But I still use a GLM, so it's a still a linear model. And then the, the fourth one is that I say, okay, it's a function of all these things, plus I'm going to use a random forest. So these are the, these are the four models. And so I can run that uh, comparison, let's see. And now what, uh, what it does, it uh, Carrot goes and basically does the, all this cross validation um, and everything I said here. So I said, split it into three parts and then repeat it one time. Uh, and then I can go and say uh, subset is subset the results like this. And I can say plot it. And, and here what you see, uh, so what, what, so this is the key to, to understand the predictive soil mapping. This is really the key, uh, the key explanation. So, so what you see here, there are two parameters of uh, let's say accuracy. One is called the RMSC, one is R squared. Probably you heard about this in your statistics courses. The RMSC is simply the, it's a, uh, basically errors that you um, derive from the, on the validation points. So you, you just derive errors. And, and what you see here, this is a box plot. So this is a distribution of errors. The, the, the black spot is the mean RMSC. And this one is a distribution because remember here, uh, we said that we want to repeat. We want to uh, repeat, uh, sorry, we have the subsets and we also want to repeat. I could repeat also more times. I could put, I want to repeat four times. I don't know, but you see, then it becomes more computational uh, and it can, it can take a more time, but I could also repeat it. Um, and you see now I'm computing. I can see my computer is doing computing and then I can again revisualize that. Uh, I just rerun it. And there's no change, there's a little, the numbers went up and down. But uh, so I repeated it. So now the, if I do more repetition, see just these extremes, they become like they're a bit like wider because by accident, you, the values could go up, up and down. And so what you see here is uh, uh, RMSC R squared. In essence, RMSC R squared, in essence for linear, uh, normally distributed variable for linear modeling, they are basically the same thing, except the RMSC it's in the absolute scale 
and the R squared is the relative scale. So that's the only really difference, but they are kind of the same thing, except the uh, RMS is absolute scale, R squared is in relative scale, and they are also inverse. So in the worst then in, in a sense that uh, R square you want to maximize and uh, the, uh, uh, the RMS you want to minimize. So if you, if you look at now, which is the best model? So uh, you obviously can see it's random forest. And this is also kind of a evolution, this plot, this little example with like 10 lines of code. This is really the evolution of pedometrics and predictive soil mapping because in the old days, we could only do, we could only get the points sample and then estimate the mean and have this uh, descriptive, uh, like a central tendency measures. Then after that, we started making soil maps. Then beyond that, we, we, uh, we added to soil maps, digital terrain model, all these other parameters. So we, we switch more to a, like a GIS analysis. And then beyond that, we do machine learning. And you see the between these distributions, there is very little overlap. So these are actual, you could say the actual uh, jumps in technology, jumps in evolution. So you can see that if we add a soil map, we increase the accuracy significantly. There is no overlap between two distributions. So we increase, we produce uh, information which is significantly more accurate. If we uh, add more covariance distance to the, uh, to the um, uh, river, it also increases uh, accuracy. Also, it's a jump in accuracy. And then if we add random forest, uh, another level of complexity, much more computational, but it pays off because it helps us increase accuracy, but not for much. You know, this scale here, you see this goes from 3.5 uh, and this is two. So, so maybe this is a bit exaggerated, so it, we don't, you know, we don't, uh, we cannot bring the RMS to zero. You know, it's not, it's not going to happen. Even if now I do some uh, deep learning or if I do ensemble machine learning, you know, I'm not going to increase it a lot, but nevertheless, officially we, with the random forest, we can significantly improve accuracy. So I have a, I have a objective proof and I could repeat this uh, training and validation many times, hundred times, and I will always get about the same result. And so this is, this is basically predictive soil mapping in, in essence. Um, and uh, so this is all, all as, as I said, this is all these things in my book and in the book, you can just follow it like this. You can, you can read it and uh, you can uh, of course read all the text and, and then you see how it slowly develops going from two dimensional to three dimensional, three dimensional interpolation and three dimension looks something like this. Um, so, so this is the three dimensional and let me send you that. And something, and this something I started doing about uh, maybe uh, uh, seven, eight years ago, I started doing this three dimensional soil mapping and uh, it looks like, wow, you do 3D and stuff, but uh, actually it's not, nothing too complicated. Uh, you have, uh, what you do is that you have the soil profiles so you have this data that which is uh, has also changes through depth, um, and and then you do overlay, and you include uh, you include this uh, depth as a variable. Um, I even made a little functions to uh, account for the thickness of the horizons if you have soil profiles, and so you add this uh, depth. Uh, so here's the depth you see, you add it to the uh, to the modeling, uh, and then. And then you build again, you do the train model and you see, I do also a five, uh, uh, five fold cross validation. I do only one repeat to uh, make it fast, run fast. And, and then I get the random forest and then I can compare the, uh, uh, I can see the variable importance and I can also compare it with some other, I can do QBIST, et cetera, or SG boost. Uh, and I can compare different, uh, different algorithms. And this is what I get for the five centimeter. This is also soil organic carbon, uh, but now with more points, this is data set from Australia. And then I can compare methods and then I can plot, uh, plot the accuracy. So that's the accuracy plot. Now, the, because the space, uh, when you do, uh, you go from 2D to 3D. So you go maybe like if you have, I don't know, 200 locations, but you have uh, maybe three or four depths. So you easily go from 200 to 1000 points. And you see now there's much more points and, and also I plot this, uh, I plot this in the log scale. 
so I can see uh, how where the problem. So there are some little points. You see these points here and these points here that uh, bas basically the measured organic carbon is like five percent organic carbon, but we predict like uh, you know uh, zero point two or something. So there there is a serious under prediction for some points, but for many points we have a we have a okay prediction and. And that's also reflected again in the R square and, and uh, you can then see, and visually you can see that uh, when you look at the prediction, so that this is XG boost, this is random forest, uh, this is Qubis. Uh, so you can see that the Qubis kind of smooths out the signal, uh, random forest, uh, uh, it's somewhere in between and XG boost can even predict very high values here. Um, and then when you do ensemble out of the three models, um, you, you get these things. And so about, about also about seven, eight years ago, I got really interested in this ensemble machine learning and uh, ensemble machine learning means, you know, you take multiple learners and, and you want to get the best, best accumulated estimate. Um, and so I got really interested in that. And then I started looking at how do you do it? So, so I find this package uh, called, uh, um, so this one is the H2 ensemble. So there's a package with, a, it, it runs in Java, but it's really well documented and you have to reorganize the data at the beginning. But once you, once you reorganize, you can just do this H ensemble and, and you can, and it will like automatically uh, basically fit an ensemble model. Uh, and then you get, a, you get the result and you can see uh, which, of the, which of the learners is the most important, et cetera. Um, and in this case, you see that when I train this same data set, I will, I will get usually the smallest RMSC I get from random forest, you see, random forest. And, and here's some uh, second one on the list is the GBM. Um, and so you can compare. And the linear model, you see it's a, a GLM, it's, it's kind of off. I mean, it's like uh, two to three times worse than random forest. So you get approximately much lower weights for the linear models, but random forest gets all the weights, all the, and then the, if you compare the individual, so the individual learners, uh, the, it's called MSC here, but it's a, you, if you take a square root, then you get the RMSC. Uh, the individual learners, they will, the, the best one will be 0 0.099, 799. And then if you do ensemble, it will be 0 0.0752. So it's a bit it's a bit better than the the best learner. That's usually what happens with ensemble learning. You you get it a bit better than the than the base learner. And that's something then that's a motivation to use uh, to use ensemble machine learning. But I was uh, using that machine uh, this ensemble machine learning. I tried with the uh, with the H two H two ensemble, and I tried with the super learner package. The both in R. Um, and this super learner looked like this was for me. Oh, wow, this is really nicely documented. There's a lot of learners. This is all the family of learners you can use. And so I said like, oh, wow, this is really good package. But then I noticed it's not, it's not really maintained. And, you know, when you look at the, on the website of the super learner package, you can see that the tutorial is still like from three years ago. And, um, and then I discovered another package, which is called MLR. And, uh, and MLR kind of has uh, similar, like super learner, it has, uh, uh, has similar, like a family of uh, learners you can use, but just bigger. It's, uh, it's almost now here, you see like uh, it's for regression, there's like 60. So there's 60 uh, learners just to do regression. Uh, and so I got excited. Wow, you can, uh, you can do lots of stuff here. And also this is a community of people developing MLR. Uh, MLR, I mean, it's a, it's a, the name is as simple as possible, machine learning in R, MLR. Don't think it's something, anything else. Uh, so it's a very simple name. And, and, uh, but these people really made that uh, package. And I think it's really, uh, it was a good choice to switch to that MLR. And then I went, I went and I said, hey, let me, uh, let me put that and uh, let me put it in my package. So I'll show you now how this looks in the, I made this package uh, land maps. And I also, you know, here I have to do lots of things. I have to make code to do this benchmarking and things. And so I, I put all this code into a package. Uh, and so now it's a much easier for everyone to do that. So let's, let's take a look at some examples. Um, it's, a, it's a super simple to use. Uh, so let's, let's do this. And so now, now we are switching like to one line. 
uh, basically one. So I load this uh, uh, mass data set and I load the uh, land map and then oof, I did the install, sorry. I always install it. So here's the, the land map. Uh, and then I can do, I can do now train. And now I put all these uh, basically steps. I put them, <laughs> I grab them. So you see there's many steps and, and I, by default, I use something that I find like a strong learners. I, I use the, the Ranger XG boost and, uh, and you see this thing is a, uh, it's a uh, running, uh, it's running in parallel. So I could also see that it goes in parallel. Uh, ah, yes, I need to load the uh, MLR, sorry, uh, library. I need to, load. so, so it, I, I wrapped a lot of steps and as you see now, it's even running in parallel, I think. Uh, so you see, it almost goes to 100 CPU. And, and then once it finishes, I have the model. So here's the model, I have the model. And now I can look at that model. So this model, I call it, uh, I call it trains SP learner and I call the model, it's of the class uh, uh, SP learner. Uh, and so when you look at this model, I can, I can get this summary. So here's the summary of the model. And so what, what does this show now? Um, and I will go back, I will also show you the steps, but basically it shows that uh, from all, so to do a map of the zinc, so to map this thing here, uh, we, uh, uh, the only thing that really matters is random forest because the others, they get a much lower T value on the, on the linear model. And so the, the random forest is the most important and the other models actually are not significant. I could just remove them, but I don't have to remove them because by default they get a very low weight. So the weight is close to, the weight is close to zero. Uh, if I rerun this, and I by default I run a five-fold cross-validation. If I rerun this, uh, and you see I um, I also uh, estimate the block size for the spatial cross-validation, and uh, I also um, I also do the I add the oblique coordinates. I add oblique coordinates to the mapping, uh, so it also it, it does something like a regression Kriging, universal Kriging system that you have the covariates and you have the distances of geography. Uh, and then if I look again at the model, uh, now it's a, it is this N net, it becomes a bit significant, but uh, marginally. So just through this iteration, we can see that it's marginally significant. And I can see that the R square is about 0.65. Um, so, so that's something, you know, that let's say the, the best we can get. And then I can make a map of zinc. I would just go and say predict M, right? Uh, so as simple as that. And so I will get the predictions and now I can plot them. Uh, let's see, where's the plot? And uh, no, let me see in the, I, I don't want to uh, plot by hand now because I have code uh, train SP learner. So here's the prediction of the of the zinc. This is the location of points, and this one is the predicted error. And this error is based on using this uh, uh, random forest error package, uh, called uh, forest error package. So so here we get the prediction. So that's the zinc now predicted, and you see it's a it's a skewed variable. It's a it's a skewed variable, but I in this case I don't have to do any log transformation because random forest doesn't require, require it. And also I don't have to do um, no GLM link functions or anything because uh, we only use nonlinear learners. Uh, so you have this concentration zinc and then we can go and plot that. Uh, so let me plot that here somewhere. So I can also plot it in a Google earth and I can use a, The same legend, uh, let's see this one. So let's take a look at that. 
And so uh, I missed the legend weight. Uh, typo. So let's take a look. Yeah, so this is now the same legend. And so I can look at it and you see that it matches quite okay. Uh, so here's the, here are the high values and, and blue, so blue is lower and, uh, and you can see that it is really uh, visually, you can tell that the highest correlation is the most important covariate is the distance to river, right? Um, and you, you can see that the, the learner, they, it tries to really come close to the point. So, so here's a bit higher value, like these values are like 200. This one is a bit higher. And, and the learner really tries to get to that uh, point. But here, for example, you have a very high point, but there's no red color, right? Uh, because what happened is that this point is so much isolated that it uh, looks like uh, that, uh, yeah, it's very difficult for any learner to find relationship between this point and that uh, high value. And, and that's also visible in the, uh, if I look at the uh, uh, accuracy map, you can see uh, here that the accuracy will be also a bit higher here. So uh, it's a bit higher than in this place where we have a low values. And it's also very high where we have a highest values so as expected, the accuracy gets uh, higher. So yeah, that's a kind of a deus ex machina. You see, you can uh, now take any data set. If you, you only have to say, these are my points, these are my covariates and poof, off you go. You can make, you can make maps. And let me just rerun this uh, one more time, uh, uh, recompute it. Uh, so now I, I do another another randomization. I recompute it, um, and then we can again do the prediction. So this takes a bit of time. Uh, so we take prediction. And so here's the, the model is finished. Uh, here's the prediction. And now I do another plot. And, and you can see it's a bit, it's a bit different now, but the, the, uh, the predictions don't change much. I mean, the predictions are kind of set, but the errors, I mean, th there's some, something with this randomization, the errors can go a bit up and down. Uh, so if I look, uh, if I look here, maybe, uh, so the errors go a bit up and down and, uh, and that, so I will have to zoom in and see why that happens. But if I look at the two randomization, you can see that the, the general patterns, I think is the same, but in a different randomization here, we get, we can be higher, a bit lower, higher value. And in this uh, randomization, it's a bit higher. So you remember this individual point, which is very high. So I could do that now, you know, many times, but in essence, the, the predictions are kind of set. Um, they don't change too much, but the, uh, the prediction error is a bit more unstable. And so why, why does this happen? But because I randomize every time uh, and every randomization will be different. That's a one thing. And then the second thing is, this is a relatively small data set. So once you move to using like, uh, you know, 1000, 10,000 points, then uh, even if you randomize, if you randomize these subsets and you do this cross validation, the, uh, the differences are much less, they're less and less because of the size of the samples that you use. So, uh, so that's, the, that's kind of the essence of uh, today's what we do the, uh, for predictive cell mapping. So we use ensemble machine learning and, um, and we use it to do, uh, to automate. So we can, we can just, you see, this is like, you now put, you put the, uh, the points and you put the, um, the, the points and covariates and then off you go. Um, and then the other thing I want to show you, and I have that uh, uh, tutorial also, there are multiple tutorials here, but I think for you it will be very interesting and something we will start tomorrow first. Uh, it's the uh, tutorial on ensemble machine learning. And that explains all these reasons why to do ensemble machine learning. So I will send you that also on the on chat. So you can, uh, you can read it before tomorrow. Uh, so that's the ensemble machine learning. Uh, and then uh, I will slowly show you, you know, this ensemble machine learning, how it works and uh, how you can even do this multi-scale uh, ensemble machine learning uh, and how you can also apply to factor type variable. So if you do for classification purposes, you can make uh, probability maps uh, and you can also plug in these distances 
and you can also get the errors. Um, and then I will show uh, I will show a bit that tomorrow how it's done. And after that, we're going to switch to to this one, uh, which is doing space time. So it's the same thing, just uh, moving from using ensemble machine learning not only for spatial data, but using it for the for the time data. So that this is called two D plus time. And then the final, final level, it's doing uh, so-called uh, 3D plus time. And 3D plus time, you get, you get something like this. Uh, you get these uh, uh, changes of uh, uh, soul property that you, it's even difficult to visualize because you have predictions uh, both in space and time uh, and in depth. So it, you have to like make these slices, you know, you make predictions of slices and then you have to animate, you have to animate these changes um, and you can maybe then turn off some layers, you know, to see how this change and, but it's a, it's a really different ball game. And I can open you this data set, it's a, this data set's available. So I can open you the data set so you can play yourself with it. And so this is like a full uh, space time, 3D plus time or 4D, how you want to call it. So that's the full framework. Going beyond that, there's the 5D, right? No, I'm just joking. There's no 5D yet, uh, but uh, there is a possibility to do a, a multi-scale space time, etc. Uh, so, but uh, I don't want to take too much time now. I think I, I this was just a really crash crash course. Um, can it be considered dynamic time series modeling? Uh, yes, in principle, if you use ensemble machine learning to fit a variable in space time, uh, but you, you, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, for me, dynamic modeling is about modeling processes. So, uh, so I would say no to your question because yeah, for me, dynamic modeling is modeling, uh, processes, but, but it's, a uh, for sure you can use machine learning to do space time interpolation of values. So that you can fill in all the gaps and you can produce these uh, predictions through space time. Um, and then to do, to combine it with dynamic modeling, like a process based modeling, that's a different story. Uh, but there are some work, there are some papers that uh, kind of have some ideas how this could be done. But it's a new arena, it's, a, uh, it's called hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, soil data modeling. So it's really new arena. There's, I think, many things will happen uh, there. And with this thing, I would like to stop. Uh, 